But I'll tell you what, when I'm done, my biceps are humongous. Humongous. My name is Anthony Bevilacqua, and I'm the host of New York Muscle Radio Podcast. My arms have been a weak point for years. When I started training, my arms measured 11 inches. Even after many years of hardcore training, nothing would get them to grow. With the help of my co-host, Big E, we set out on a mission to gain one solid inch to my arms in 12 weeks. In the greatest experiment of all. 12 weeks later, this program finally helped me get 18 inch arms. The 12 week arm experiment, the ultimate arm growth program, ebook, the audio book, and the workout video. Pick up your copy now on NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. New York's very own muscle building coaches, Anthony Bevilacqua and Pete Kacharian, proudly present to you New York Muscle Radio. What's up, guys? New York Muscle Radio, episode number 119. It's your host, Anthony Bavalacqua, along with my co-host, Big Pete Kacharian. And if you're a new listener, welcome to the best muscle-building podcast on iTunes. Today's topic, improve your squats with these five hacks. This is actually fitting because I wanted to give you some advice on your squats based on what you told me the other day, big guy. You said you were having some trouble with your squats. So I actually have something we'll talk about, I guess, later. Um, for your squats, I think will help a lot. I've been, it's been brewing in my mind. Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to offer a little bit of value to this podcast, but I'm also going to soak in a lot too because I'm not going to lie. I'm one of those people that could probably use a few tips on the squat. Um, I wouldn't say I need tips. I, I definitely know uh, definitely how to improve my squat, but as far as mobility issues, you could teach me a thing or two about that because that's definitely not my area of expertise. Yeah, man. So it's exciting. We're recording this podcast on the the eve of the Mr. Olympia contest, 2016. This is probably going to be a controversial one again because of Kevin Lavroni competing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know, man. I kind of think, you know, it, we saw some pictures of him yesterday, and his upper body looks really good, man. You can't you can't take it away from him. He looks really good. I just don't know if he's going to, you know, do anything. Yeah, I, I don't know. If, I, I, I don't I would... think he's going to make it. You know. The, you know, the thing that was exciting about him returning to the Olympia stage is if he came in even 90% of his best, he could easily win, you know? But for him to be able to come back 90% of his all-time best after taking so many years off of training and aging on top of it, uh, it would be pretty hard to happen. And I'd say he came close to hitting that 90%, but he's definitely not at 90% of where he is. I'd say maybe he's... 85, 88, but an 85% Kevin Lavroni is still better than a lot of Olympia competitors. I'm not saying he would be the best, but even at 85%, uh, he's not going to get crushed on stage. Let's put it that way. I was laughing because um, they posted up some pictures of him, and uh, he, he apparently during the press conference, he took off his shirt and started posing, and Cedric McMillan came and started posing with him. And someone made a meme of uh, Cedric like turned to Lavroni and was like talking to him uh-huh. and someone made a meme that I was cracking up they said a meme that said bro you look great how long have you been lifting and then <laughs> Lavroni <laughs> answered like oh I've been lifting for five months I was dying I was laughing I mean in five months you know you want to talk about genetics right he's got crazy genetics and granted like you said he hasn't probably hasn't trained like that in a long time too so the you know the result that he that he brought to the stage is going to be you know phenomenal but I don't there's no way if he would have taken two years to do this, I would have said, "All right, yeah, he'll definitely crack crack top three. But uh, yeah, it now, would be, now we're one year, man, or five months, whatever. I know. How long has he been training for it? Something like yeah, that sounds about right. You know, it's it's only that's been nuts. months. It's it's only been months, and that's coming off of like I don't even know if he was touching weights. You know, he at one point he was so downsized that he was like smaller than the average person or the average gym goer, I should say. And, you know, just looking like a totally average person. Uh, But, you know, like I said on on an earlier podcast, that's not necessarily a bad thing because he's letting his he he let his body rest all those years. It's not like he was still beating himself up for 15 years, then decided to come back on the Olympia stage. You know, he didn't he didn't spend too much time digging himself into the ground. He was fresh coming back to it. But, you know, like I said, age and and time is going to is going to place a big factor in that. And I think that's what's unfortunately holding him back now. Yeah. Well, whatever. We'll see. So I, I'm going to say I'll give you my top five. I has, still have Phil Heath winning, which is terrible. I really don't like him. I used to like Phil Heath a lot, but eh, I have him winning just because 
there's really no competition, I guess. And I have Dexter Jackson second. I, I like Dexter Jackson. I really hope he pulls it off and wins again, but I doubt it. Then I have Sean Roden. I have him in third. Um, Cedric McMillan, he looks great. I have him in fourth. And fifth, I have uh, Dallas McCarver. I mean, you never know how this is going to go. And then I have Lavroni actually in sixth. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not going to lie. I'm rooting for Lavroni to crack top five. Uh, I think he could do it. It, it. You know, it's like anything else, and this is not just on the Olympia stage. It's it's any type of competitive bodybuilding. It all come, Placings all come down to whoever shows up and how they show up, you know? So if Dallas McCarver comes in looking great, he can crack top five. If he comes in looking like shit, you know, Lavroni's going to steal that spot. And, you know, if Phil Heath comes in off, he might lose to Dexter Jackson. You never he know. Was off, he was off last year, though, and they, they still gave it to him. Yeah, well, you know what the problem is? You know, and Phil Heath fans are going to hate me for saying this. The fact that Phil Heath wins year after year is not... I mean, Phil Heath is a great bodybuilder. He looks great, but his competition level is not really there. You know, he's just in a different league than everybody else. So if anybody else steps up to his league... Uh, he he would definitely have some competitors that could give him a run for his money. You know, like I said, a ninety percent Kevin Lavroni could do that. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see that. Uh, Dallas McCarver is a very young guy. He's in a couple of years. I think he's going to take that Olympia's title easily. Uh, so it should be should be interesting to see what happens this year. I think, to be honest, I I think Phil Heath is still going to win this year. Dexter Jackson could definitely give him a run for his money, but. I'd say this might be the last year for Phil Heath. That's my prediction. I'm not even going to predict the top five. I'm just going to say uh, I think Lavroni can crack the top five, and I think this might be Phil Heath's last year on top. If he cracks top five, does that mean bodybuilding hasn't moved? It, it, yep, I would I would say so, man. I mean, at least if it has, it's not moved in any place dramatically because, like I said, if you if you go back and you look at some of the nine like the the nineties the Olymp like when when Lavroni was at his prime and you look at the Olympia lineup the top ten, any of those guys could give Phil Heath a run for his money, you know that's how crazy it is. You know the nineties is when bodybuilding was insane. You know it definitely improved over the years, but it's taken steps back also. Yeah, I mean if you if you have like Ronnie Coleman like even Ronnie yeah. Ronnie's years if you have Ronnie Coleman you throw like Phil Heath in the mix. He wouldn't if you have Jay Cutler, Ronnie, mm -hmm. and whatever who else they competed with. Even the, if you could throw just those two in there, Phil Heath doesn't even crack top five. Yeah, it's it's yep, it's unfortunate, man, how it's changed. But I mean, if you're looking at those physiques, the conditioning they brought back then was just it was it's unmatched to right now. We have some guys now who are in a different league with muscle size, but still none of them match Ronnie Coleman in his prime. That's you know he was so far ahead of his time. It's insane. Yeah, he was a monster. And I'm telling you, I'm convinced it's because he trained twice a week. Well, he, you know, Heavy that, as fuck. there's a few guys out there that still follow that same philosophy and they have insane muscle gains, you know, like, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, great genetics, you know, but, you know, Akeem Williams is doing the, the Olympia this year. And, you know, he's his prediction from a lot of people is he's not going to he's going to be like top. He's going to make like 15th place. But uh, if you've seen the amount of muscle he's carrying and how much he's put on over the years, he's one of those guys. His training style is very similar to Ronnie Coleman. He's got those genetics, so I think if he keeps going in the direction he's going, he could definitely, you know, I I wouldn't say exceed what Ronnie Coleman has done, but he could definitely be on the same lane, level playing field. And it's you know, it, his training is not like some of these guys. It's not like the Phil Heath pump sets and you know half reps, quarter reps, and stuff like that. It's heavy squats, heavy deadlifts. You know, twice. Didn't a week. Ronnie Coleman just like. But when he first started competing, wasn't he like getting fifteenth place, like like bottom mm -hmm. finishing at the bottom, and then all of a sudden he just came in the next year and just like won? Wasn't it something crazy like that? Yeah, so that that is actually a very, that's a very funny story because he was uh, he was always placed. Yeah, he was you know he was he was a very a very great bodybuilder, but he was not a threat for winning the Olympia title. And there's a funny story about that. Anybody who knows their bodybuilding history knows this. Uh, Flex Wheeler was pretty much the guy on top at the time when Ronnie you know, started winning the Olympia stage and he had a conversation with, with flex one year. And he said, you know, I really want to do well. What am I doing wrong? What can I do to improve? And, you know, flex gave him a little advice to this day. He doesn't necessarily say what that advice is, but I guess you could imagine. And, you know, Ronnie Coleman that year came back on stage and just blew everybody away. And he still, to this day, if you ask Ronnie Coleman about it, he'll tell you that, you know, it, it was all about the advice that flex Wheeler gave him prior to that Olympia. Mm, so, I wonder what advice what advices he gave him. Well, I'm sure he's never going to give those advices out again, <laughs> at least not to his competitors. Well, I want to I want to jump ship here. So we're talking about the Olympia. 
and mm. ad- secret advices that these guys are giving each other to the USAPL, which is the natural drug-free powerlifting organization who I would say, you know, they compete. That This organization is like the best in powerlifting and they're tr- I think they're trying to really push to make powerlifting an Olympic sport. Um, so anyway, they actually sent out an email to all the competitors and I'm sure you got the same email too, talking about the drug testing, saying that they had the highest amount of failed drug tests um, this year and that they're fined heavily for it and they might not be allowed to compete in the world games. It's just insane, man. So yeah. nuts how people just cheat like that, you know? Like, listen, if you want to take stuff, that's fine. If you want to go on your hormone replacement therapy, <laughs> that's cool. Just pick another organization. Don't ruin it for everybody else, you know? You know, it's very, it's embarrassing, but unfortunately it just comes with the territory of any competitive sport, especially something like powerlifting or bodybuilding. And it's very hard to actually have a clean organization because there's always going to be people that cheat. But, you know, this is definitely a combination of the competitors' faults. And, you know, I have to put some of the blame on the organization as well because it's their it's their job to control that. You know what I mean? And like I said, you can never you can never have a perfect organization where everybody gets caught and, you know, everybody is, you know, they, they play by the rules. There's always going to be somebody trying to cheat. But, um, you know, it's a good thing that they're catching them now. Obviously, they are because they're, obviously they're failing drug tests. But it shouldn't get to the point where when these guys are getting sent to the world championships that they're getting caught then. These guys should be getting caught at the local meets. And I said this to you too. I would like to see the local meets run a little bit better. The procedures, pretty much anybody can sign up to compete. And then at the end of the meet, they hand out a couple, you know, urine sample cups and they say, okay, we're going to, we're going to drug test you, you know, and there's plenty of people that get by, you know, eventually they get caught, but you want to catch them early. That's, that's my, you know, that's the way I would do it. Well, the thing is they, they give random drug tests to the guys who compete in the world contest. So like, um, what was his name? I got his name, Jesse. What's yeah, his name? Jesse Norris. Yes. Thank you. Uh, he got busted right. for taking a stimulant, you know, not even during an event. There was a random test. Right. So you can't say that. I mean, you know, and it's a big organization. You know how many people compete in power things? It's kind of hard to keep an eye on everybody. But yeah. just morally, I just don't understand people. I really don't. You know, I, I don't, I, I can't, I, I agree. I can't really say what what's going on in the minds of those people but you know that like like you said there's plenty of organizations you can compete in that aren't going to drug test you so i never understand why you would do that and then compete in it in a tested organization it's just it's it's pointless in my opinion like yeah. if you, if you want to compete at a higher level and you want to take performance enhancing drugs do it where everybody else is doing it also yeah i don't know it's just people's mentality with things is just unbelievable yeah, it takes away some of the uh, some of the fun out of it, I guess. But you know, it is what it is. Yeah, and that's gotta suck, you know, too. Like if you lose to someone like that, like let's say you you had a chance of cracking top three, or even or even first place. Let's say you came in second, and then to find out that the guy who won first got popped for a drug test later on, like he's taking away your moment, you know. Well, like, that's, that's a, your moment to stand on the platform, you know. That's a very common issue, <laughs> you know, and I, I don't think that's going away anytime soon. To be honest with you, I, I think that there's definitely ways that they can prevent that but again it's going to come down to money you know if if the if the organization had an unlimited amount of money then they can drug test everybody before every event they can drug test everybody randomly they could eliminate a lot of the problems but again it's going to come down to money mm-hmm. yep all right guys well news on the new york muscle radio front um in the last podcast we did i believe it was the last one we uh, released our free program the J- get jacked in 12 so again, if you guys have been using that program, we want to see some hashtags and tagging us on Instagram and Facebook. The hashtag is get jacked, J-K-K-E-D, in 12. We're just curious how many of you, unfortunately, our website doesn't tell us how many downloads we have. So I, I can't tell how many people actually <laughs> downloaded the program, which is such a stupid thing. I don't know why it does that. I'm pretty sure I could look into a way to do that, but it's not really worth yeah. it. I'll just take you guys, you know, downloading it and trying it and letting us know on social media as word for it. So, again, you can pick up that free program, free, no strings attached, free program at NewYorkMuscleRadio.com slash products. Yeah, and in free doesn't mean that it was a program that we kind of slapped together in the last second. Like a lot of time and effort went into developing that program. So you're getting something that we normally would charge money for, and anybody who would come for a customized program would receive something similar, obviously tailored to the individual. 
but I'm saying the amount of time and uh, work that went into that program would be the same as something we would put together for a client individual. So if you're looking for a very general routine that's going to get you bigger, stronger, and perform harder, the Get Jacked in 12 program is going to do that for you. Yep. And you can head on over there. We also had um, someone tag someone else on our social media somewhere. I don't remember where it was, my account, Pete's account, whatever. And uh, someone had made a comment saying about the ARM program, I'm not going to pay for an, uh, a quote unquote ebook. I just wanted to clarify that the ARM program is not an ebook. We designed it as a course, it's just in, I guess, a PDF format. Yeah, I'm actually glad you brought that up too because I wanted to mention the same thing too because we call it the 12 12 week arm experiment and it comes in an ebook format obviously, but it's it's like you said it's much more than that. It is a program. It's a 12 week program. So when you purchase that, you are going on a 12 week program. Uh, the details of it are outlined in a PDF in an ebook format, but it also it has the audio version and it also has the, the video that goes along with it. But it's a program that if you're ready to start it and you pick it up, you're going to be on it for 12 weeks, 12 weeks long. And we're explaining the process throughout from start to finish. So, um, you know, it's, that's the reason that the, the price is a little bit higher than something you might purchase, uh, for just a, a quick ebook that teaches you how to do a few sets of arm exercises. We're actually outlining a 12 week program from start to finish, which if you do follow correctly, you could get similar results that Anthony had got, which was bringing his arms up a full inch in 12 weeks. So, uh, you know, it's definitely not just an ebook that you're going to purchase where, you read a manual really quick. Okay, you need to do five sets of 10 on barbell curls and dumbbell curls, and then you're done for the day. You know, it's not one of those yeah. things. Exactly. So just remember, it's not a quote unquote ebook, a 10 page ebook. It's, it's way more than that, and it's going to get you what you want. If you need arms, this is the program for you. It worked for me, it worked for my co host, it worked for other people that we've put on it, and we're getting some good feedback from some of the people who had purchased it already. So if arms are your thing, and this is what you need, head on over to NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. And click on that products tab. The other thing that I want to announce, coaching is closed. We yeah. filled that last spot. Closed. Locked up. Can't get a spot with us. We're actually going to in the process of editing the website right now. So we do have a waiting list. If you guys are interested in coaching and a spot does come available, um, hop on that waiting list and we'll add you on. And as soon as the spot becomes available, we'll sign you up. But uh, until now, you cannot hire us as coaches. Yes, so we will we will keep you guys updated, but like we said, we didn't want to exceed a certain limit of clients because at that point then we would just be taking on too many and you know you, And I don't want to answer people one word answers. Yeah in emails we, because I, that's what some coaches do when uh they're overwhelmed with a lot of clients. You get back, you know, a whole detailed question you ask and you get back yes. Or if they're trying to steal your money. Yes. Or, or you could be or one both. of those or you could be one of those coaches that sends you a plan and then you never get follow ups. <laughs> Yeah, we're one of those. Yeah, but we don't do that here. So that's why there is a, uh, a limit to our client list. All right, let's move on to the shout-outs portion. Again, if you guys want a shout-out, you can head on over to NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. Click on uh, – oh, not NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. My God. Facebook.com slash Facebook. NewYorkMuscleRadio. And uh, like our page, and we'll give you a shout-out. Or you can hit us up on Instagram and Facebook. And actually, someone hit me up on uh, my fitness pal. My name on my fitness pal is Aunt Bev Fitness. Someone asked for a shout out, but because I don't know how oh, yeah? to use my fitness pal and go back to the comment, I can't find the name. So shout out to whoever messaged me on my fitness pal. You know who you are. Shout out to you. Sorry I forgot your name, but I can't find it in the comments. It's later than when you actually tag me. So again, if you guys want to follow me on my fitness pal, Aunt Bev Fitness. A N T B E V Fitness. All right. Uh, the shout outs today. Angelito Un Angel D Dios Vasquez. That's definitely how you say his name. Yeah, I got close, <laughs> man. Uh, Farah Gibbs Jean, Rob Sanzoni, Tim Suku Whiskey. <laughs> definitely wrong there. Matt Legetti. All right, guys, again, if you want to shout out, head on <laughs> Facebook.com slash New York Muscle Radio. You always crack up when I do that. You want to do it. You do it. You do it. <laughs> That's my favorite part of the podcast, man. I can't wait till we get to the shout outs. Do you have any on Instagram? Uh, I actually wanted to give a shout out because we we uh, we mentioned I think it was on the last podcast we had a little guessing game going on to see if anybody could guess who the person oh, yeah. speaking in the beginning of the podcast during the arm experiment commercial the first quote who it is and I have to I have to go back and look at the winner I do have the winner available let me see who it was but uh, do you do you want to go ahead and tell everybody who the what the correct answer is 
Yes. Well, if you guys listen to the arm commercial, which it should be right above, you know, right before all this, you should have heard it. So in the beginning, that person who talks about their arms, I forgot what he said. What does he say? He says, as soon as I do this, my biceps are humongous. Humongous. Yeah. <laughs> that was Greg Valentino. Yes. And For I, those of you that don't know, that was in that, uh, that whole thing where my arms exploded. Yeah, well, the, 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 the man whose arms exploded. But ac- yeah, yeah. actually, so it was in two different uh, features that you could see it in. It was the first one was was originally from that, but then it was later taken for the Mark Bell film, Bigger, Stronger, Faster, and that clip was played again. So if you thought it came from either of those, you would have been correct. So who guessed it right? Man, I'm still looking. I'm sorry. I'm holding everybody up here. Where the hell did we post this? It was in, I think it was a. Facebook? On Facebook, but was it on your page or New York Muscle Radio's page? I think it was on New York Muscle Radio's page. See, this is the problem is that we have all these people that talk to us and it's like hard to keep up with it and, and actually respond. It's, it's hard. It's tough. It's not as easy as it sounds. I should have should have wrote it down before, but it looks like uh, I got to scroll back. So you, some you stuff. dropped the ball on that, huh? What else is new? I know, man. Late to the podcast, late to recording the podcast. <laughs> now you dropped the ball. Are you looking it up or no? I am looking it up. Uh, was it in the group or was it on the Facebook page? I see, think it's on the Facebook page. See, man. guys, we have too many. We have stuff all over the place. We have groups. We have Facebook pages. Yeah. Speaking of which, if you guys actually didn't join the group, join the group on Facebook. We usually sometimes we make announcements for things in there. And actually, I should announce what I wrote in there the other day. Um, we're looking for three to five people who want to come on the podcast, record with us live. And uh, we want to do like a case study, a podcast on pretty much people's progress. And we want to basically do coaching calls with you. So if you're interested in having us uh, coming on the podcast, being live on the podcast, talking about your issue, problem, whatever, and having two great coaches, the best in the industry, come and solve your problems, head on over to find us on Facebook, our Facebook group, facebook.com. I believe it's New York Muscle Radio also. Um, The name of the group is New York Muscle Radio. But you can find the group. And I don't even know how you search for a group, but you search for the group, find it, comment on that that thread, and you'll be chosen. If you're chosen, I'll send you a message and we'll hook up, have you come on the podcast and just basically do a coaching call with you. I think it'd be a cool podcast. I kind of came up with the idea. I got to really just post that on the Facebook page. So I think I'll do that today. Yeah. So, I mean, it's basically we're going to have somebody come on here the same way that we would do an individual coaching call if somebody wanted maybe an hour consultation with us and said, listen, uh, I'm currently doing this, but I'm stalling right here. What do you guys suggest I do? And we'll basically assess where you're at and tell you what you should do from there. Kind of a one-time fix uh, you know, not to say that you can fix a whole diet or workout program one time. These things generally have to be adjusted, but we could point you in the right direction. Maybe you're doing it the wrong way. And we're going to do it in front of all our listeners so everybody can learn from it. This is this would be a good podcast. I'm super excited for it. So again, head on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash New York Muscle Radio. I'll uh, repost that up today. Yeah, but now I, I found the winner so I could shout him oh, out over time. here. So it was, uh, we actually got a few that I'm going to give credit to, but the, the winner would be Dan Sen, I believe is the way you pronounce his name. It's spelled S E H N, so Dan Sen. Uh, but he said that it would be Greg Valentino, and he would be absolutely correct. I also want to give a shout out to Kalina Garza, that would be our client, Kalina. Uh, she also said that she was guessing. She was a she, Jet fan, which is this. Is she a Jet fan? It's not, not mm. good. We bleed blue here on New York Muscle Radio. That is the Giants. True. Uh, salsa but- all day, salsa dancing all day. <laughs> but she had actually guessed. Uh, she said it was. She thought maybe it was one of the Bell Brothers because she said she remembers it from Bigger, Stronger, Faster. It was from that film, but it was not one of the Bell Brothers. It was Greg Valentino. And shout out to Ernesto Grumpzilla because he also guessed Greg Valentino, but he was not the first. So I'm going to give him credit also. All right, Dan. So what you could do is send us an email, newyorkmuscleradio.com at gmail. Uh, New York, I keep saying .com. It's just a habit. Send us an email, newyorkmuscleradio at gmail.com, and we'll uh, we'll send you a little prize for winning, buddy. So thank you for playing. See, guys, if you pay attention to what we say and you actually take action because that's what we want. We want people to take action. There's prizes involved. You win. Now we're going to get like 20 people. Hey, guys, I think it's Greg Valentino. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, too late. Contest over. You got to pay attention. You got to be quick. You got to act. All right, let's move on to the listener question of the day. So, again, if you guys have a question and you want us to answer it for you, submit it on our website, newyorkmuscleradio.com slash listener question. So today's tip is from uh, Brian Connolly, and he says, for a training tip or a quick something to talk about in the beginning of a podcast, uh, if you could make a gym in your garage, which I'm about to do soon, what are the core pieces of equipment you should have and where to get them? Well, I did this, 
So I'm going to hold off on answering this question. I'm going to hand it over to you, big guy, because this is something that you want to do. So yes. I think it'd be perfect from your point of view, and then I could just fill in the holes since you're going to do this anyway. So go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, obviously the, the biggest thing that's going to come down to is budget because if I had an unlimited budget, my, uh, my gym would look a lot different than how it probably will look. Uh, but first, you know, I got, I got to go in order of uh, importance and priorities first. And I would say that the first thing that has to be in there is a good quality power rack uh, because pretty much if you have the right power rack uh, plus a bench, you can set it up to do every exercise that you really need to, or at least 95% of the exercises you need to. So a good quality power rack, obviously barbell and plates, and then a bench, I would say an adjustable bench. So you can set it up to do flat bench, uh, military press, incline bench. And if you have enough weights with a power rack, a barbell and a bench, you're pretty much set to go. Uh, if you want to include some dumbbells in there and maybe some type of cable pull down on there, sometimes power racks come with that. I, I really can't see you missing anything that's a necessity. You know, you can hit every muscle from pretty much every angle. Uh, it's nice to have machines and stuff like that, but that's obviously not the heart of a garage gym. So I would say if you have that, I, I can't say you're missing anything that you wouldn't need to either get the, as strong as possible or build as much muscle as possible. Did I leave anything out? What do you think? Um, I mean, it really, again, like you said, it's going to depend on budget. But again, like you said, a power rack is definitely a necessity. That's going to be pretty much your center of your gym. That's going to be the heart and soul. Uh, a power rack, a bench, and basic barbells and obviously plates that go with that. That's going to be the central heart of your gym. And it's going to depend on space and your budget, you know, what you can fit in there. You could really do a lot with a lot, you know, with very little or you could, you know, really spice it up. So I would say in addition to that, um, obviously, make sure the power rack has somewhere to do pull-ups because that's going to be important. So make sure you just get a power rack that has one. And you can do this for relatively cheap as well. You know, Rogue Fitness makes um, the standing like stands, like squat stands, but they have one that's like has a pull-up attachment to it. So if I could redo that, I'd probably get that because it takes up less space. Um, also, if what, if I, what I would do if I were you, um, since the power rack and the bench are going to be the center of the heart of your gym – I would put a platform in, either build one, which is very simple to do with plywood, um, or just pick one up. You could pick one up at Rogue or wherever. Um, build one around your squat rack. This way you have a nice steady floor to squat on, and you could use the same spot to deadlift on to make it a little bit bigger. Um, I would also pick up – you could probably go on Amazon and pick up like a plate-loaded um, lat pull-down. Those are really good. Those would definitely help. Um, so this way you could do pull-downs, you know, tricep extensions. You can even do some face pulls, rows off that, you know, depending on which one. I think Body Solid makes a good one or Power Line makes a good one. Um, again, it really is going to depend on budget and how much space you have. You could pick up a leg press, you know, for about a grand off Amazon as well. So if you have, if you want to put a leg press in, um, I would say a good set of adjustable dumbbells. I actually have two set of adjustable dumbbells. I have uh, the Bowflex dumbbells that go to 90 pounds and then I have Power Block that go to 150 and those are really good. They're really space-saving. The reason why I have two is because I train clients out of there, so sometimes I need multiple dumbbells. Um, so you could definitely pick one of those up. <sighs> what am I missing? I really obviously, can't think of anything else you would obviously need. Obviously, you, you, you may have to put a sub-flooring in. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know what it would be, but you'd have to put some sub-flooring in. But again, if your heart of the gym is going to be the power rack and the deadlift platform that you're going to build out off the power rack, um, you really don't need a really great floor after that. Because obviously you're not going to be slamming dumbbells. You're not an idiot. So you, know, you really don't have to worry about the floor unless it's uneven. Then you're going to have yeah. to construct that's, in there. That's the biggest problem. you know, And that's something that, that a lot of people have to pay attention to wherever they're, they're putting their equipment, whether it's in your basement or it's in a room in your house or if it is your garage, especially if it's the garage, a lot of times the flooring is not going to be either level or maybe you have concrete that's a little bit broken up. That's an issue that I have. Uh, I actually have space in my garage. I don't use my garage for anything. I don't park my car in there or anything. And it's completely empty other than the gym equipment that I have in there. But the floor, the concrete's been destroyed since I've moved in here. And I have to get the concrete redone in there. I have to get the walls done. And then I'd be ready to really put the weights in there and start working out in there. But that's a big issue that I have. Uh, other than that, I could work out in there with the equipment I have right now, which I, I do do sometimes. But uh, I have uh, I have chunks of concrete just broken out of there where I laid plywood over it just to give it a flat floor. But, you know, you got to have a solid floor, especially if you're going to be squatting and deadlifting. You don't want to have an uneven floor. You don't want that bar rolling when you're deadlifting. 
Yeah, so I think that answers the listener question of the day. Again, if you guys have a question you want us to answer it, head on over to NewYorkMuscleRadio.com slash listener question. I actually have one more quick shout out because I was on Instagram while you were talking. And uh, it's from J. Rod Physique. He actually just tagged us in a post. He said, had to give a quick shout out to New York Muscle Radio, Pete and Anthony. Have a kick-ass show for anyone from a bodybuilder to a powerlifter and everything in between. I already can't wait to try out some of the advice they gave out and watch it to improve my overall physique. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to their podcast. That was really cool. Love hearing that. He must be a new listener. So, again, thank you for the support, buddy, and a huge shout-out to you. Yeah, shout-out to J-Rod. I, like I always say, I love when people contact us and let us, let us know they've been listening and they're at, you know, it's helping them with their fitness journey because we have no idea that you're doing anything when you listen to us unless you mention it to us. So Yeah, yeah I'm actually you know. writing him back right now. I know you have a hard time actually doing that, Big Pete. Yes, so, uh, it's very I'm, I'm writing him back, <laughs> and I'm writing him, you know, thanks. Thanks for listening. Oh, you, you, you wanted me to talk while I typed? <laughs> do I have to do everything? I thought so you were gonna. I thought you were gonna. Once? I thought you were gonna explain. Uh, All right, let's go to. Let's to take him. a short commercial break. We'll be right back. All right. What's up, New York Muscle Radio listeners? It's your co-host, Big Pete Kacharian, and I'm glad you're all listening. Put down the tilapia and asparagus. Learn how to get bigger, stronger, and leaner eating what you want. Pick up a copy of Cracking the Flexible Diet Code exclusively at NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. But for now, let's get to the show. Hey guys, it's your host, Anthony Bevilacqua, and I just wanted to announce that my brand new personal training facility is now open. I'm currently taking on new clients in the Long Island, New York area. If you're interested in working with the best personal trainer in the business, head on over to abfitnesstrainer.com and sign up for your free consultation. Then you can understand why bodybuilding.com has named me personal trainer of the month. All right, guys, we're back. New York Muscle Radio, episode number 119. So today's topic, improve your squats with these five hacks. Hacks. Secrets. I'm tired of the word secrets, so that's why hacks. Well, tip number one, don't do hack squats. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, they don't really have much carryover <laughs> to uh, – nothing really has carryover to squats, though. I mean, no, I yes. shouldn't say that. Honestly, the, I would say the only exercise that I've ever done besides a squat variation would be the deadlift that has a carryover to it. No, there is one, and that's going to be the last, the last hack. Ah, but the last hack. saying like a like a hack squat had, had doesn't have a carryover to squats, but has a carryover as far as development goes for your quads. It's weird yes. how that works. And right? I, I actually, I, like I've mentioned on in previous podcasts, I, I would put hack squats pretty much neck and neck with a barbell squat in terms of quad development, not strength, not overall strength, but just quad development. And I think it's a great exercise to use for that specifically. Other than that, I don't give it as much credit as a barbell squat. Yeah. All right. So five hacks that are going to improve your squat in general. Obviously, uh, the one thing that I'm going to cover, this is, this is hack zero. <laughs> your form should be 100%, but that should go without saying. Yes. So I'm not going to make that a hack on its own. This is just, you know, given that your form is 100%, that you've taken the time out to adjust your form, make sure it's correct, take videos like I recommend. I've said this on so many different podcasts. Football players watch tape, endless, endless hours of them playing on the field tape to figure out what mistakes they're making, and it should be the same for you if you're serious about your gains. You know, video yourself squatting from all different angles if you can, and just focus on getting the form down 100%. So we're not even going to cover that beyond that. So all these hacks will work if that is given. So the first hack, I gave it away, is uh, take lots of videos. Yeah, That's the first hack. I think that's a really good tool to use because, first of all, you'd be surprised at what your form actually looks like compared to what you think it looks like. It's almost like if you uh, if you record yourself speaking and then you play it back and listen to it and you say, wow, I actually sound like that. You know, you think you sound a certain way, but then when you listen to it, you sound completely different. It's the same thing when you see yourself doing something that you might even be watching. You know, you watch yourself in the mirror, you watch yourself squat. But when you turn that camera on, you can see every flaw in your squat. You know, it's so funny. Any, it's so anything true. you do, you know, in the, you know, the camera doesn't lie. You know, you might think that you're, you're squatting with your hips high or low or whatever it is, uh, deadlifting the same thing. And you look and it might be completely different. I can't tell you, I had the same conversation with Anthony. He had filmed me when I was doing a, a deadlift and I said, yeah, I dropped my hips a little bit right before I pulled, but I don't think it's significant. He filmed that. I looked at it and my hips were dropping drastically low. Yeah, I think um, the same thing happens for me too because when I squat in my head mentally, 
I mean, there's a couple things that go on mentally when you do squats. Obviously, the, I think the first one that goes through everyone's mind, you know, everyone, I would say it's, you know, don't get crushed. Yeah. That's obviously the thing that goes, it doesn't matter how many reps you're supposed to do, whatever, just don't get crushed is usually one of those things that floats in your mind. But um, for me, I always feel like, ah, oh, I didn't make depth. I didn't make depth. And then I, thank God I take a lot of video <laughs> because then I look at the video, I'm like, oh, I almost touched the ground there. Yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised what you think depth is. And then you look at the video and it's not, you know, I sent Anthony a video one time when I was testing, testing out my maxes on squats. And I, when I hit it, I said, you know, I hit a new max and I said, I, I killed it. And then I went back and looked at the video and I said, wow, actually it's questionable how low my depth is if I made it or not. So I sent it to Anthony and he's like, you're just shy of it. You know? And in my head, I, I thought I smashed it, but looking at the video, I, I didn't, you know? Yeah, that's how it goes. So this is why we do recommend taking a lot of video. It's going to help improve your form and it's going to help you become a better you squatting. You're going to see all your flaws. You'll find out, you know, where you have some weaknesses. Maybe your knees come in, you know, maybe they don't push out. Maybe you're not locking out. You know, I had um, one of our clients sent us a video of himself squatting and he wasn't locking out his hips on the top and he was taking away a lot of power doing that. So again, you could see so much from video if you know what you're looking for. Yep, and so, this this will go pretty much with anything. You know, you could do this with any lift, but you know, it's, we're talking about squats today, so that would be that would definitely be the first place to start because a lot of people might say, you know, if you're if you're having trouble locking out, you need to fix this. If you're having trouble, you know, out of the bottom, you need to fix this. But you have to see what you're doing first and see where the weak point is and where your flaws are. Then you go about fixing them because you might think wow, I can't lock out correctly, but maybe you just didn't move out of the hole correctly to begin with. Maybe your balance is off. You know, yeah, find the floor exactly. first, and then, then worry about how to fix it. All right. The second hack, I think we can move on. We covered that. It's pretty much self-explanatory. The second hack, if your goal is to obviously improve in squats as far as lifting more weight, which obviously over time will add to bigger quads, um, we recommend using a low bar position. Using a low bar position will allow you to hit depth a lot easier and allow you to actually move more weight because it'll – put the bar a little bit over center of gravity. I remember when I switched from high bar to low bar, it was like such a world of a difference. High bar, I would consider high bar a whole different movement. Yeah, it's actually crazy because you're only talking about a few difference, a few inches in difference as far as the position of that bar on your on your shoulders and your back. And it, it pretty much does turn it into almost a whole new movement. I mean, you're still going to be engaging the same muscle groups, but you know, the angle at which your body is going to move is going to be significantly different just from moving that bar a little bit. And if you're one of those people that has trouble, uh, you know, handling heavy weight just by supporting it on your back, you'd be surprised if you have thick uh, rear delts where you could kind of just sit it on, on a, the little shelf back there, how much easier it makes even stabilizing that weight with your upper body and then focusing on just using the legs to, to move the weight. I know for me, I had a lot of trouble years ago with my lower back not being able to support that heavy weight, almost like you're explaining, feeling like you're getting crushed. You know, that had a lot to do with muscle imbalances that I have corrected over over the years. But initially, when I kind of hit a wall with my squat, my quads were huge. My glutes and my hamstrings and my lower back weren't up to par with that. So switching it to the low bar actually started to engage those muscles a little bit more. And it actually felt more comfortable stabilizing it there because I had more of a center of gravity, like you said, to squat heavier weights. So then I can engage those muscle groups more. Obviously, I focused on doing other things to bring up those muscle groups. But develop uh, development being uneven, switching it to a low bar position allowed me to handle a lot more weight comfortably as well. Yeah, for me, I had a hard time, man, hard time getting um, – when I do high bar, the bar, I, I guess because I'm a skinny guy naturally, just my my neck vertebrae stick out so much uh, back there for whatever reason mm -hmm. is. I guess I just can't build mass in that one area. So when I put the bar high on my neck, it kills me, man. I get pain down my shoulder. Like it's bad. When I was squatting super heavy before I knew anything about anything um, – I actually had like a little bit of a knot. Nick, actually, it's funny. If you look at pictures of Arnold, he had the same knot like right on. I know what you're talking about too. Yeah, it's like a big bowl. Yes, it looks like a yes. big bowl back there. And that's like scar tissue buildup from like squatting heavy back there. And uh, like Pete's checking his neck. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> funny. You're bringing back memories because I think at one point I had that too. I remember when I first started squatting again because Arnold was probably the first person I looked at. So obviously, I emul emulated the way he was squatting. And, you know, like you said, you're basically pressing right on the on the back of your neck there. And I remember that, too, specifically. I built up a lot of, I guess it was scar tissue, you know, and eventually 
that pain kind of went away because you're pretty much numb to it. But uh, it's not a comfortable place to put the bar. And a lot of times I cringe when I see people doing a high bar squat because I can tell they don't know any better that a low bar position might actually be more more of a comfortable placement. Not to mention they're going to be handling heavier weights, squatting more, uh, growing more quad size by doing that. But just squatting with the bar that high in your neck on your on top of your traps gen- generally is not the, the most efficient way to do it. You know, it has, yeah. its, it has its place if you want to use a high bar squat for a specific reason, but if your goal is to build big, strong legs and squat the most, you're definitely going to benefit from moving that bar down. Yeah. I would also say, too, um, you know, when Arnold actually would use um, a ped. If you mm. look at some of his pictures yeah. of him squatting, he would use a ped back there because it's, it's going to bother you. But generally, as soon as I moved to a low bar position, it was just felt so much more comfortable for me and uh, less pain. Because I, I actually switched back to um, high bar for a while when I had my injury just to kind of work around it. And, you know... I was getting that pain again. I'm like, you know, forget this. Yeah, I, I actually I switched back recently too as well, and I actually found that I was a lot stronger at a high bar position from doing low bar religiously for years. Like I said, I've kind of built up those muscle groups that I was neglecting for a while, and the high bar position became more comfortable, at least from the squatting standpoint. But positioning on my back, it's funny because it, it pretty much reminded me how tight my traps are because and anybody who knows who has – tight muscle groups when you put a heavy load on top of it how painful it can be just sitting a bar with about you know three or four plates on it pushing down on the traps it's pretty painful you know Mm -hmm. you you don't want to be thinking about that when you're squatting heavy weight but again it exposed me to the fact that i have tightness in my traps which generally i do have which i have to focus on uh you know loosening them up a lot more because i definitely have chronic tight traps yeah so again if you guys are um you know, having trouble with high bar or you just want to be able to squat more weight, use that hack and low bar will change your positioning. It's almost, it's a really totally different movement. When you switch back to high bar from doing low bar, it almost feels like a front squat. Yeah. Just and the it, angle that it puts very, you very similar. Yeah. So, all right. Let's go to hack number three. Um, we're going to, for this one, you want to use knee wraps or knee sleeves and a belt. I prefer knee sleeves over knee wraps. I don't like using knee wraps because it's inconsistent. Sometimes you could, you know, wrap them really hard, sometimes not. So I definitely recommend a good pair of knee sleeves and a belt, a good quality belt. I know I've been uh, disagreeing with that, but uh, I actually bought a new belt, a nice lever belt, and it's actually working out pretty good for me. I feel a big difference, and, you know, I'm trying to improve in powerlifting. Hopefully I'll be able to break a record someday. So I'm really trying to uh, utilize what I can, and a belt is just part of that. Plus a lot of people have gotten in my head saying, you know, <laughs> You're crazy for squatting, you know, over 500 pounds without a belt. So I can, I have a very strong core and I can do it. So, but using a belt, you could definitely eke out a little bit more if you know how to use it correctly. Yeah. I mean, I've been saying that for years because I have pretty much been squatting with a belt since I started weight training. I, there's a very, very short period of time before I purchased my first belt. And, you know, I started out with just the shitty Velcro ones, which, you know, they're, oh my God, me too. They're, they're better than nothing, you know, but they're not going to provide you that type of stability that, you know, a nice leather thick belt is going to do. And again, if you're using a leather belt too, you don't want a tapered belt because be, be, believe it or not, a lot of people don't realize, but the, the main purpose of the belt is actually the front of it the most important part because your core is going to be bracing against the belt it's not the back the back is just tying it around your waist so really the, the purpose of having a, a thick heavy belt is so that when you take it's called a valsalva maneuver when you take in all that air and you push it out against the belt that's going to cause you know that's going to brace your core and it's going to cause a lot more pressure in abdominally which is going to stabilize your whole body you know so you're not going to have that force on your spine the same way as if you didn't have the belt so if you have a tapered belt you know some of those you might see in the old like 70s bodybuilding magazines where uh, the front of it might be two inches the back might be four you're pretty much defeating the purpose you want a nice thick belt in the front yeah and knee wraps too knee sleeves yeah knee sleeves can definitely add some poundages to your squats so, uh, it, again, it's one of those things that as soon as you slip them on, they're very consistent. You know, you get the same amount of tightness out of them. They'll keep your knees warm and nice and safe. And I think mentally, too, um, if you want longevity in this sport, which obviously you'll be bigger and stronger if you last longer in the sport. So um, make sure you pick up a good quality pair of knee sleeves. I like SBDs. Some of my friends have bought in, uh, the knockoff brand on Amazon, and they work just as fine. Um, I think uh, Mark Bell makes a good one, too. 
I think that I don't know if they're <laughs> they might be banned and uh Yeah, he has two of them. I think one of them are banned in the USAPL because apparently they 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 ate a little tight, bit. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, I use I use the SBD ones and for years I just, you know, I only considered a belt. I was like, what what is what is a knee sleeve going to offer me? And I started using them maybe a year ago and I can't tell you how much I love them. Uh they they are probably one of the best pieces of lifting gear that I've ever purchased. And it's not necessarily because I have bad knees or uh, I need to keep them warm. Just the comfort that it adds around my knees makes squatting that mu- makes me that much more confident in my squats, knowing that my knees are supported. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say my knees are beat up, but they definitely aren't the same way they were when I first started training. You know, after years and years of training, you do get a little bit of tightness in the area. You know, your IT bands might be inflamed. Your quads <laughs> might, might be inflamed. They might snap in half. They might snap in half. But, you know, when you have that inflammation built up, you might confuse that with joint pain or it might make those joints not move the same way as if those muscles were nice and loose. So a lot of times, um, you know, warming up is going to be a big thing. When you have a nice tight uh, knee sleeve on, it's going to help keep the joints lubricated and warm because the warmth is there. So, you know, it makes the warm up process a lot shorter. And then once you're warmed up, you stay warm. You know, that's the biggest thing for me squatting now. Uh, not, not when I first started, but more recently now, the warm up process is a lot more in depth. You know, I can't just walk in and start squatting heavy. I do have to do a lot of stuff to loosen up and putting the knee sleeves on helps me warm up to those heavier weights faster. And then when I'm ready to go, like I said, the confidence is there because you know your joints are nice and supported. So between the lifting belt and the knee sleeves, I'd say that you're pretty much covered uh, as far as you know accessories you need to help you lift that heavy weight. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really don't have much to add to that. I would say, you know, over the years of squatting, my knees are, are creaky. Yeah, that would be the way I would, dis- you know, I would when describe it. When I mine. do, I guess it's maybe because I'm too, I'm warming up too. Usually I'll start with like a plate mm-hmm. um, and I'll do a couple of sets. And as I'm going down, I hear my yeah. knee. I'm like, oh no, both my knees. I'm like, oh, that's not good. But it does, I don't have any pain. It's just they're very creaky. You know, and then I'll, I'll do it again with two plates. You know, I'll go one plate, two plate, then I'll go to three plates. And then uh, I usually slip my sleeves on after that and do it, you know, whatever I'm going to do for the day or whatever, another warm up set. And then usually I don't hear the creaking anymore. So I'm like, oh, and I'm starting to think that maybe I should put them on right away. Yeah. I mean, I don't like to put anything on right away because I, I maybe it's just a mental thing, but I, I do like to try and warm up with as little as possible. There's, using, a, there's using, a lot of people who actually just put everything on and then start. Yeah. They'll use a belt and everything just starting off. So well, I don't know. I mean, I guess you could. That's something I guess it would boil down to yeah. personal preference. But I agree with you there. There's pros and cons to doing it both ways. But the the way I look at it is, do I really need a belt to squat 225? You know, do I need knee sleeves? So usually my first few sets, you know, like you said, I'll do one plate, two plate, three plate. By the time I get up to the third plate, is when I'll usually put the, you know, I'll put the knee sleeves on first, then I'll put the belt on the next set, and then go with my working sets. But I like to do one plate and two plate. With nothing, just because I like to have my body warmed up on its own without using any type of artificial enhancement with that. But, you know, the first set with one plate, two plates, everything feels a little tight. My knees will, you know, to be warming up sometimes there's a little bit of tension in there. You, you know, three plates with a knee sleeve actually feels more comfortable than one plate without it. So there's definitely value to be added from a, from a knee sleeve. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Hack number four is going to be wear the proper shoe. This is very, very important, and uh, I actually love my squat shoes. I turned my co-host on to squat shoes, and uh, they really make a huge difference. You're able to really plant your heel a lot more into the floor. For those of you who lack ankle flexibility, this may be one of those things that really, really help you dig into the ground and keep those heels down. It's almost like having an elevated heel the whole time, and you're able, actually able to sink down a lot lower using a squat shoe. So I'd recommend picking a pair up. Um, you know, I like... Um, I use Reebok. That's just what I bought, and that's what I've kind of been stuck with. Um, my co-host here has the Adida Powers. A friend of mine has the Nike Ro- uh, Romeos. How do you how do they say them? Romeos? I think it's Ro- Ro- Romeos. I don't even know. Whatever the, the Nike ones, and he loves those. Um, you know, there's so many different pairs. So just find one that you like, uh, find one that's on sale, whatever, and just get them and use them. Yeah, yeah. They really make mm-hmm. a big difference. I like to use them. I actually pretty much use them every time I work out now because they're perfect on bench. They help you plant your heels to the floor. Um, for curls, they're really good too because you can plant your heels. Um, just overall, it's just it, now now using them. I don't. It's very hard to switch back and use mm-hmm. something else. You know, I've used Converse before, and um, you know, I suffered my injury because I think I'm I'm sinking too low. So I switched to, back to the squat shoe, and I feel better. So. Um, 
you know, again, it's all going to boil down to mm -hmm. personal preference, but a squat shoe, you'll definitely feel more secure also. I yes. think that's a better way to put it, you know, with the weight. Yeah, and I, for years, never really saw the value in a squat shoe, you know, and if you're, if you're talking about uh, using a, a, a lot of people might say, just use a flat sole, use Converse. And you know what, if you're using a compressed type shoe with a sole, a very soft sole, and you switch to a Converse, yeah, that's going to make a big difference. But now if, you, if you're squatting on a hard sole or no sole, and then you compare that to using maybe an elevated heel with a very, very hard heel, uh, you're going to see a night and day difference, especially if you have certain mobility issues or if you're weak in certain areas. For myself, uh, like I said, I squatted for years with Converse, never really seeing the value in using a squat shoe. And my ankle flexibility is definitely something that's not up to par with uh, somebody who's a great squatter. Uh, but my squat's decent, you know, but it made it made squatting very uncomfortable after a while. And, you know, just chalked it up as, you know, it being a mobility issue that I need to work on. But when I first started using squat shoes with an elevated heel, I noticed right away how much more comfortable it was just to hit depth. And we're talking about a very minimal heel. You know, the difference is not drastic, but as far as how it feels when you're squatting, it makes all the difference. And Besides just the heel elevation, like you said, it's very stable and it'll make you feel like you're planted into the ground. It's hard to describe what it feels like, but if you were to wear squat shoes and walk around in everyday life, you would feel very awkward doing that, the way it's planted on the floor. Because it's so flat, you cannot roll on your ankle left or right. Your your foot is planted on the floor. So that's a big thing too. A lot of times when people squat, they don't realize it, but they might want to roll onto the sides of their feet. And that's definitely not going to help you squat heavy weights. Mm -hmm. So if you do have a tendency to kind of push out and roll on your feet a little bit, the squat shoe's not going to allow you to do that. So when your feet are planted, you're planted in place. So, you know, small, small difference, but makes a huge difference as far as uh, what you're going to achieve on the squat. So if you're, yeah. if you have any type of issues with that, if you put them on, you'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised what, what it feels like and how you perform. So this brings me back to what I said in the intro here. Um, this is going to be hack 4.5. Um, this is like a half hack here. So you were talking to me. You had some issues with your squat. Do you want to fill it in and then I'll give you what I've been thinking about because it's been brewing in my mind? Yeah. So Fill I mean, everyone in, Big Pete. I mean, if anybody who listens to us regularly, they know I was talking recently about my my bed causing issues. I, I don't really sleep on a very, very comfortable bed and I, it's definitely time to upgrade. And I experience a lot of tightness, especially in the morning. And I've noticed that progressively over the last I mean I've had issues with um, with mobility and tightness for the last maybe two years but I, I'm saying in the last six to eight weeks it's just gotten progressively worse to the point where I said you know it's time for a new mattress and I've noticed it's affecting it's very little it's affecting my deadlift very little my squat however has just been getting progressively worse in terms of comfort and I would say being in the groove when I squat it almost feels like every time I get under the bar my motor pattern is different as if I haven't squatted in like six months or a year you know I'm just not comfortable doing it and I told Anthony even 135 feels uncomfortable hitting depth it has nothing to do with the heavy weights and believe it or not when I get up to the heavier weights it actually feels more comfortable to hit depth because I have the heavy weight pushing me down. So even just with no weight on the bar, hitting hitting depth with 135 feels pretty uncomfortable. So we were talking, you know, off air on on uh, just a normal conversation about things I could do to improve that. And obviously, mobility is going to be one, and getting getting a mattress <laughs> that actually doesn't cause me to get tight is going to help me as well. All right. So here's what I've been thinking. So you got a lot of issues going on here. Granted, the mattress is one of them. But the other thing that you suffer from a lot is your ankle flexibility. Your ankle flexibility is terrible. And, you know, whenever you do anything with your legs, it's always going to be from the ground up. You always have to be stable from the ground up. So what I was thinking was I think a, a huge issue for you is obviously the ankle flexibility. But what happens is your IT bands get super tight. And since it all starts from the ground, what's happening is your ankle flexibility is not there. It's pulling on your calf and your tibia, which is pulling on your legs, pulling you a little bit forward, which is going to affect your IT band. So my solution to you would be um, I also recommend to you to warm up a lot too beforehand, which you know that should go without saying. Yeah. You should be warming up. I think that you should do calves before you do any type of lower body movement because – one, we were doing that before in the past and it was working good. You weren't having as much pain. You were able to get down. Um, and two, it'll pump up your calf and allow you to have some type of rebound out of the bottom. 
and it'll loosen all those ankle muscles up a lot. I think it'll help you a lot. And if you suffer from the same thing that Big Pete does, I really think it'll make a huge difference for you. It's actually a really good tip. I've never really thought about it like that. It definitely stems from the ground up because, like you said, every muscle that you mentioned gets pretty tight. I mean, you want to know something interesting? The other night, actually, I was I was, I was, was at home and I was stretching a little bit just to see where my muscles are the tightest. And believe it or not, do you know what part of my lower body was excessively tight that I had no yes. idea? Not even my calves. Think even smaller. Your, your ankle? My toes. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. My toes, when I would stretch Listen, what them, you do on a Friday night, I don't want to know about. <laughs> no, but believe it or not, when I was stretching, I was stretching my calves, I was stretching my ankles, and I was I was basically, the bottom of my foot was so tight that my toes actually lacked flexibility. I mean, I never heard of that before, but like I said, it always starts from the bottom up. And if you have an imbalance at the bottom, you're going to shorten all those muscles from your calf down, and that's going to pull on everything. So I think if you do calves and you really focus on getting a good stretch at the bottom, I think that'll help loosen up your ankle and allow you to get deeper with e- with more ease, and it's like a better warm up for yeah. you. Yeah, and you. I, I could definitely you know tell people that ankle flexibility and and mobility is going to affect a lot of other things. You know, you might think, am hey, I so what? My ankles are not that flexible, so what? I could still squat, but. If you're starting to have issues with flexibility and, and mobility and the squat is just not feeling well, take a look and see how flexible your calves are and your ankles because uh, if you can't really do too much with your ankles, you'll be surprised how much that throws off your squat. So you got you to gotta fix fix all those uh, weak links in the chain. And you know I'm one of those people that doesn't like to spend too much time on little things. I kind of like to go after the most important stuff. You know, when I go in the gym, I want to just start training. I don't want to sit around and I don't want to – foam roll and you know loosen up for a half hour but unfortunately it's one of those things you got to do and eventually it will catch up to you if you don't do it yeah and we're talking about longevity in the sport too so you know five ten minutes here 15 minutes here can make can make a huge difference if you could squat more your legs are going to grow you're going to get that much stronger you're going to get to your goals a lot faster so you know you got to put in the work for it big guy sorry well but i really think that that ankle that just doing calves beforehand will make a huge difference yeah, and you know, it's funny because, and I spoke to you about this too, for me in particular, uh, I think that a lot of that issue with the flexibility in the ankle has, has a lot to do with my calf development as well, because if you don't have a lot of flexibility in your ankles, it's very hard for you to perform calf raises optimally and, you know, to the point where you're actually going to, you're going to develop more calf muscles because if you can't do those exercises correctly because of tightness, it's going to affect everything. It's the same thing as a squat, but think about it on a smaller scale. So I think a lot of people who have issues with calf development as well could also benefit from from ankle flexibility. Yeah. All right, let's move on to hack number five. Hack number five is going to be a secret exercise that I use to improve my squats. And it's actually a really good one because most people suffer from this. Um, I would say the secret exercise for me, let's see if you know it. I know what it is because we had this conversation before. Uh, and, right. and, and, and and actually, I want to tell a backstory too. And I, don't, right. I don't know if you know about this, even though you're the one who has to do with. But So the answer is going to be, it's going to be a glute bridge, right? Well, or a hip, hip thrust, thrust, hip thrust, thrust hip thrust, yes. A barbell hip thrust yeah, with so, a fucking lot of weight. Because, all right, one of the things, let me explain it first. So the yeah. reason why this is hack number five and this will help improve your squat. When you're, most people get stuck on squats coming out of the hole, giggity, you know, Coming <laughs> out of the bottom, so you squat down, you hit depth, and then you come back up. As soon as you come back up, one of the things that's firing and that helps lock out the movement is the glutes. So if you're squeezing your glutes super hard, you're going to end up slamming the weight all the way up. So if you're practicing that movement by doing a hip thrust, you know that you're going to get there a lot faster. And most people actually, believe it or not, have weak glutes. So that's like usually the weak link in the chain. So that's my Hack number five. Yeah, so I have to, ahead, t- tell I, have to I have to tell this story because it's actually hilarious. But this was not your last powerlifting meet, but the one before. Um, I think it. What, what did you squat without the belt that time? In that meet? Yeah, not your last one. The the one before it. Uh like five twenty something five, like that. Five twenty with no five twenty <laughs> with no belt. Uh, and I re- I remember so a little backstory. So be- prior to that meet, I was training with Anthony pretty regularly, and we also had another person training with us. That was Joe. So at the, <laughs> at the meet, myself and Joe were there, and we were we were at the meet 
right before your last attempt, and you went in with no belt or whatever, 520. Joe looks at me and he says, if Anthony fucking hits this, he's going to come back and he's going to say, it's from the hip thrust. It's from the hip thrust, right? Anthony goes out without his belt, squats, five, what is it, 520? Yeah, whatever it was. 520, no belt, and smashes it. Wasn't It looked like a warm-up. Comes back all pumped up, goes... Those hip thrusts work. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even remember that. Yes, yes. It was the only thing you said. That was what you said after you squatted it. And what did you Joe, you and Joe say? We just looked at each other and we just started laughing. That's hilarious. I didn't even know that. But I'm telling you, man, it really makes a big difference. Apparently it does. A huge difference. Because that's I, what you're I, using out of the bottom. Yes, yes. I mean, I actually, I have to, I have to agree that there definitely is a benefit to doing those. Especially, like you said, if you have weak glutes. Because... Um, you know, basically the way you, you, you taught me this too, I wasn't doing this for a long time is that from the top up, once you kind of break parallel and you're coming out of the hole, you have to just slam your glutes forward, which is exact, exactly what you're doing in a hip thrust. So that's a movement that if you're, if you're not strong on, you can, you can load up a lot of weight on the hip thrust and get strong doing that motion pretty much to the point where it'll make locking out a squat with anything possible as long, provided you can get out of the hole you can lock it out if you practice those hip thrusts mm -hmm. all right guys well those were the five hacks to improve your squats and trust me if you take action on all this stuff stop listening to this podcast and not taking action take fucking action and let us know you know how much more your squats improve yeah, don't be one of those people that buy the self improvement book and then just read it. <laughs> <laughs> Although that's probably as, as that's probably about what it's good for. <laughs> All right, big guy, it's All your right. turn, buddy. All right, guys, Pete and Anthony, New York Muscle Radio, and we're out. Enjoyed this episode of New York Muscle Radio? Make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave us a five star review, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, New York Muscle Radio.